If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 26 with me. Acts 26. Uh, we are coming down the home stretch of the book of Acts. Uh, by the time we finish, we will be close to have being been in Acts on Sunday mornings uh, close to two years. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the dates, uh, but that saying, time flies when you're having fun, applies uh, to our study, and I've really, really enjoyed it, and uh, we praise God uh, for that. Let me give you the title of my message. It's Paul's Testimony. Paul's Testimony. Listen, folks, everybody has a testimony. Okay, if you're born again, you have a testimony. And uh, I will say this, in the world in which we live, uh, to have a testimony, you have to have a test. All right, God tests uh, his children, and we can see that going on right now. Let me give you the outline. Number one, Paul's opening statement. And uh, Paul was not a lawyer by occupation, but I'm telling you, he controlled this trial scene. Uh, that you will see today, and then we'll see it again next week. And then, you know, he'll be transported to Rome. You know, I'm just telling you, the next three weeks, you don't want to miss. Just the text is exciting, and uh, we are excited about uh, teaching and preaching this. Number two, Paul sharing his past. Everybody has a past. And do you know who tries to remind you of your past? Uh, Satan, doesn't he? All right, folks, we've been forgiven. Quit listening to his lies. You are born again. The Bible says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. But Paul shared his past. And number three, Paul's conversion experience. He had one of probably the most uh, prolific, uh, one of the most life-changing uh, conversion experiences uh, known to mankind. And uh, this, if you are keeping track, this is the third time, and he'll share it again uh, four times his testimony before uh, courts of laws, and of course, you know, he, he is going to appeal to Caesar, and that will be the culmination. That's what he wanted to do. That's what his assignment was uh, since uh, he found Christ. You know, Festus decided that Paul's case was going to be a difficult uh, case, so he got King Agrippa to try the case for him. Since it was a Roman court and no Roman official could come up with real charges against Paul, they couldn't legally arrest Paul, even though he had been under house arrest for two years. The reason Paul wouldn't fight being on trial was because it gave him another opportunity to share the gospel of Christ using his testimony. Paul's commitment to Jesus Christ gave him the courage to face a strong opposition with confidence and peace. All he truly wanted uh, was to be able to tell his side of the story without his life being threatened or a decision having already been made. Paul's appeal to Caesar trumped everyone else's, so really Paul had nothing to lose. Let's look at Paul speaking to King Agrippa. Acts 26, verse 1, Paul's opening statement. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And we saw last week, you know, Agrippa came into the court and all the pomp and circumstances and all, you know, you know, just a parade type thing. Uh, they had all the dignitaries there, all the important people. And, and so he was in control. Agrippa was, uh, but you will see Paul taking control. It says, verse, the next verse, so Paul stretched out his hand and answered himself. Why would he stretch out his hand? Because I'm telling you, he was fixing to preach. All right? I mean, he, he, he stretched it out, and, and he was simply saying, I've got something to say. And he does say a lot. I think myself happy, King Agrippa. I thought it was interesting that he started with the word happy. All right? He just wanted Agrippa to know he's not upset. He's not mad. Even though he really was arrested illegally as a Roman citizen, he is going to get uh, what he uh, wanted to do. Folks, his purpose in life, just as Phil is saying, was to lift up the cross, to tell people about Jesus. And what better way than the highest emperor in that region and speaking to him? 
Because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I am accused of by the Jews. See, they brought a big shot lawyer in uh, two years ago and gave them the charges. And I'm just telling you, none of them was true. None of them stuck. They believed Paul that time, and I don't think it's going to be any different this time. And Paul is just simply saying, we'll go through this again if you will allow me to speak. Verse 3, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which I ha have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. What is he saying? You're not going to get a sermonette, okay? You're going to get the whole load, folks. And, and Paul did just that. And he wasn't just trying to play up uh, to King Agrippa. He was making a point that was extremely important. He wanted people to know in that courtroom, and he wanted Agrippa to know where he came from. Well, if, hold your fingers there and go to Philippians chapter 3 with me. Philippians chapter 3. Paul later on to the church at Philippi uh, gave some instructions there on who he was. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. For we are of the circumcision, and that made him a Jew. That was the sign, that was the Old Testament sign uh, of being a Jew, who worshiped God in the Spirit, okay, in the Spirit, which is a different thing. In the Old Testament, uh, you know, you went to the temple. In the Old Testament, you made sacrifices. But he made a reference to things that have changed. And it says... Uh, God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. All right? Folks, when we worship, we do not need to worship in the flesh. And what are you saying? Worship with an attitude. All right? Uh, folks, when we come in here, we need to forget everything outside. We come here to focus on God and to worship God alone. That's what we do. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. If you look at his life, he could say, listen to me, all right? Uh, I, I am important. I, I have arrived. But Paul wasn't that way at all. Now look at the resume. Look at the resume. Circumcised the eighth day. The stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrews of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. And probably not just a Pharisee, there's good indication of that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And you have to understand, in this court of law, there was probably still some of those folks, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, that knew he was, even though it had been 20 years since he had been there. All right? He, he, they knew him and what he was about. And it says, uh, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now here's the word. Look at verse 7. But, when, what, but, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted a loss for Christ. What is he saying? I grew up in that religion. All right? I reached the peak of being successful. I've done everything you guys think is important in life. But what I found was the most important thing in life is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Folks, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how popular you are. I don't care how respected you are. If you die without Christ, you lose everything. Knowing Jesus Christ is the most important decision you'll ever make in life. Look at verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. He's talking about trash. He's talking about things you throw away. My, my, the, the credentials that you have seen are, mean nothing to me anymore. 
I have suffered because of my uh, relationship with Jesus Christ, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is, uh, which is from God by faith. And folks, you can't work your way into heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough good things. Folks, you have to come through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no other name under heaven where man can be saved. So Paul, in his opening statement, wanted them to know for sure who he was and what he was about. Now look back in our text in Acts. Not only his opening statement here, and, and I'm just telling you, he was setting them up uh, for uh, you know, a witnessing situation. Number two, Paul sharing his past. Look, look at verse 4. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews knew. No. He's just saying, folks, I was born and raised there. I was educated there. Everybody in this room knows that that's where I was from, and that's what I was about. Verse 5, they knew me from the first if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest set, sect of our religion, I live a Pharisee. And now I stand and I am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Right there, he was saying, but the difference between me and them is I believe the holy word of God. See, these guys were still living in the Old Testament. These guys were still looking for a coming Messiah. And Paul has told them and told them every city that he went into, everywhere he went, he would tell people about Jesus. And he said, that's the difference between you and I. I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe that Jesus was arisen from the dead. And then verse 7, and to this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. And he's going back to the Old Testament law, the Old Testament things, and even the prophecy of Jesus. Psalms 22, Isaiah 53, these places in the Old Testament where it tells about a coming Messiah. So he is uh, you know, arrested. He is on trial because of his belief in a risen Savior. Then it says, For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should, it, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? See, Agrippa's wife was a Jew, and he knew of the Jewish faith and the Jewish customs and he knew uh, of a coming messiah but when you're sitting in a court of law and you see all this you know you know some of the sanhedrin and some all these folks sitting around you all right uh, kings and rulers did not want to ruffle feathers there but paul just basically calls him out he just says of all people king you should know what i'm talking about then verse 9, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And folks, you remember his story, all right? He opposed the way. He opposed Jesus Christ. He arrested folks. He, he, he did, and he searched out folks. He put them in prison. He okayed Stephen's death. And so he is giving his past and his testimony there. Verse 10, this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. Folks, I'm telling you, it was legal. He could persecute Christians. He could have Christians beaten. He could do that uh, uh, in his past. And it says, and when they were even put to death, I cast my vote against them. Folks, here's the neat thing about God. When you get saved, 
God forgives you of every sin you've ever committed. Folks, I'm just telling you, I don't, because I have one or two times people have told me, well, Brother Mike, you don't know what I've done. And you know what I say to them? No, I don't. But God knows, and God can forgive you of every sin in your life. If you will just humbly come to Jesus Christ. Verse 11, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and, and exceedingly arranged, uh, enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So there's really two points Paul is making in this trial and speaking to Agrippa. The first one is, listen, I believe in Jesus Christ and he totally changed my life. It's not just head knowledge. I mean, you talk, he, he was Saul. And in that day, if you had seen Saul in his days, you would probably not even look him in the eye. You would know of his reputation. You would know that he is hunting people. He's hunting them down and throw them into prison, not just in Jerusalem, but he was on his way to Damascus. And we know that uh, is what was going on. And so we see here Paul saying, I am telling you, I'm a changed man. I'm a changed man. And folks, I, I, I am so glad God forgives us of all of our sins. I made two false professions of faith. I made one when I was five years old. Many of you know my testimony. Uh, you know, a preacher came in, and, uh, you know, we didn't have children's church back then. You sat by your parents, and you behaved, or you got, they took care of it right then, okay? And this guy started preaching on hell, and I was five years old, and my eyes, I can just remember thinking, ooh, I don't want to go there. And I walked down an aisle, and I honestly don't remember all that went on one thing that I do remember was I got that Polaroid picture. Remember those Polaroids that come out the front? I got it when I was baptized. But folks, truthfully, my life hadn't changed. And I made another. God called me a second time when I was 14 years old at a youth camp. And I did. I went down again, and I, 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 I supposedly made a profession of faith. But about three months later, when we went back to school, I went back to doing the same things that I used to do. But folks, I am telling you, when I was 22 years old, God got a hold of my life. Bailey Smith preached the wheat and the tares. And I'm telling you, we were in an auditorium of around 3,000 people. It was as if I was the only one there and God was speaking to me. And I'm telling you, folks, God totally changed my life. God's not interested in your spiritual uh, resume, folks. He's not in, interested in your baptismal certificate. Folks, I was dumped twice because there is one faith, one baptism, and one Lord. He is saying, do you know that you know that you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Look at 1 Timothy 1 with me. 1 Timothy 1. This is Paul speaking to Timothy, and, you know, he was uh, growing him up in the ministry. He called him his son in the faith. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Folks, I'm just telling you, my life is so parallel to Paul's. I think that's why I've always been intrigued with him, Okay. One of the last things that, I, I mean, when God was calling me to the ministry, I, I was just like, you, you, you can't use me. I, I, I can't do this. All right, I know I was raised in church, and I know a lot about church, but we're talking about being in the ministry. We're talking about preaching the Word of God. And, and I did not have confidence back then because of my past. Verse 13, although I was a former blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, insolent. Folks, he was defiant is what that means. He, he, he would get into rages. He had a temper is what he is saying. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. 
and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Oh, folks, it is so nice to know you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Now look at this, and this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of who I'm the chief. Folks, you don't hold that title according to Paul. Some people want to say, I, I was one of the worst. Well, folks, according to Paul, you couldn't top him. All right, did you kill people? Did you throw people in prison? Did you try to stamp out Christianity? Did you make people blaspheme? I mean, literally go into churches and, and, and threaten them. Either you deny Christ or I'm going to have you killed. That's how bad Paul was. Verse 16, however, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Folks, I can relate to this. Why? Because God called me to salvation three times. Folks, he only had to do it once. He could have done it one time and just said, you know what, I'm done with him. He ain't listening. He's not listening. And I know and I understand the all-knowing God, but I didn't back then, I promise you. And I am so glad God is a patient God. Folks, he's given us second chances. He's given us third chances. He's given us fourth chances. Verse 17, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise. We can't match up with him. We can't understand him. He is infinite. He excels all wisdom. And we simply have to put our faith and trust in God. He's not going to let you figure everything out or, you or he wouldn't be God, folks. He is God to honor and glory forever. Amen and amen. Paul is simply saying, you know, if your excuse is, look at how bad I was. God can't forgive me. Forget it. I'm worse than you are. You can't hold a light to what I did. And you have, you have to realize, folks, this were two Jews. These, these were two Pharisees. These were two, the Sanhedrin. And that's why Jesus told them and called them out. Unless you have faith better than a Pharisee's, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. So we see Paul's opening statement. We see Paul sharing his past. And folks, there was a huge theological difference. Some, some people just say, oh, you know, it's just a different kind of religion. No, folks, it's not an exclusive thing. It's a Jesus thing. You cannot leave Jesus and him rising from the dead out. That is what the Word of God says. So the third thing we see is Paul's conversion experience. Verse 12, And while thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And folks, the sun can beat down on you, okay, as it has the last few days and is going to next week. But there's different in the sun, S-U-N, in the sun, capital S-O-N. When you see God Almighty, Jesus, the Son of God, you see the glory of God. That's why Moses' face was lit up. That's why we can't stand in the presence of an almighty God. We have to have our glorified bodies. Folks, you try to picture what God is going to look like, and you can forget it. Folks, he is so glorious. He is so pure. He is so holy. And Paul is making a description here saying, it wasn't just a bright light. It was a blinding light. 
Verse 14, and when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, and we know it was Aramaic, which, which again, that dialect there, they would know, the Jews would know exactly what he was talking about. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is uh, for you to ki kick against the goads. And again, you know, our vernacular, we don't get goads, okay? All right, it was a sharp stick that shepherds used to move cattle where they wanted them to be. And, you know, God is simply saying, why are you kicking against me? I got news for you, Saul. You're not going to win. All right? You're gonna, you're, you are going to do what I say you're going to do. I am in control of this situation. See, up to this point in Saul's life, he thought he was in control. He thought he was the one running this deal. And he found real quick with blindness, that God was in control and he did not have a say. See, he could have cleared it up in one day if he wanted to. But three days, he was totally blind. And it says, so I said, who are you, Lord? There's, there's a qualifying question right there. He, didn't, he did not know. He did not realize who he was persecuting. He thought it was the people and the way, but he was persecuting God and the church. And he said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Now later on, he became an apostle Paul, and we know one of the qualifications of an apostleship to have seen the risen Christ. Because some even said, well, he wasn't around. He did not see Jesus after that. But yes, he did, folks. Right here, Jesus spoke to him. And it says, rise up, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of things which you have seen and of the things in which I will yet reveal to you. What did he say? Get off the ground. Stand up. I'm the general here. I'm giving the orders here. All right? Do what I tell you to do. And if you are struck blind, folks, I'm telling you, you're going to obey any command that you hear from heaven. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send to you. And see, that was Jesus' prophecy. We have read through here that people were going to persecute. He was telling his disciples that persecution is coming. And folks, as a minister of the gospel today, I am telling you, it's coming. Some of it is already here. As we get closer and closer to the rapture of the church, it's going to cost you something to live for Jesus Christ. And it says, to open their eyes in order to turn, uh, turn them from darkness into light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Oh, folks, just turn on the, turn on the news. Turn on the, the news. Just the news for, for five minutes, and you can see all the evil that is going on in our world. We live in an evil world. And folks, the only solution to this is Jesus Christ, our Lord. This world needs Jesus. That's what's the matter with Jesus. you got people like Saul's, you know, uh, the way he was before he found Christ. They want to run the deal. They want to tell us Christians what to do. They want to tell us what we can say and what we can't say and what we can do and what we cannot do. Folks, I'm telling you, I am a soldier in the Lord's army. I take my orders from him. And he's saying, from the powers of Satan, Satan's power. Folks, you can sense the evil when you are around some folks. You could just sense that in your life, and, and, and it's, it's prevalent in our world today. But here's the good news, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. No one is too bad that they cannot be saved. I'm telling you, if you could sum up the gospel in two 
words. It is Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And he said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received and which you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you today, unless you believe in vain. He's saying, basically, I'm telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and truth is the word of God. Verse 3, for I delivered you, first of all, that which I have also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some has fallen asleep. In a court of law, you just needed two witnesses, two eyewitnesses. Here he is saying there were over 500 people that saw the risen Savior. Then he said, uh, after that, he was seen by James, and then the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of of due times. He just said, man, I was a little late, but I got to see him. I saw the risen Christ. And it says, for I'm the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. You may not forgive me of my past, but God forgives me of my past. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Folks, I'm telling you, I believe he worked the rest of his life. And I understand you can't totally repay God, but when you look at his life, as we have went through the book of Acts, you are seeing one of the greatest Christians that ever walk the face of the earth. He was a church planner. He was a missionary. He was a soul winner. He was a truth, uh, truth teller. And in this particular court in front of King Agrippa, all right, he was the one. He was a spiritual lawyer. He had the case. He had the evidence. He had the I testimony, which was his own. Therefore, whether I was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. 2 Corinthians 5, and I close with this, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. What is Paul saying? Listen to me, Christian. You represent Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter where you go, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what town you are in. Well, let me ask you this question. When am I not a pastor? On Fridays, I don't lay my pastor down and jump on my motorcycle, okay? Even when I'm on that motorcycle, I'm still a pastor and I'm still a Christian. So people are watching us all the time, folks. They're listening to what you say. They're watching what you do. And folks, we are the ones we are the eyewitnesses. We are the ones that believe. We are the ones that God has changed our lives. And that's what he's saying. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ as though God were pleading through us. We are that instrument. We are that tool. See, we can sit in here all day long and absorb the Word of God. But the truth of who you are is out there. It's how you live your life. It's sharing your testimony. Everyone has a testimony. And we need to be sharing that testimony as Paul did everywhere he went. He was going to the highest court of law to do the same thing. Look at the wording. We implore you 
on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. I want to say the absolute most effective tool you have in witnessing is the Word of God and your testimony. The greatest tools you have, two things. You have the Word of God and your personal testimony. And folks, we need to learn to weave that into a gospel presentation. So when somebody says, why didn't you get upset about that? You can tell them why. Because of my Jesus. Folks, we are ambassadors for Christ. And I'm telling you, Paul did not care who he was talking uh, to. Paul did not care where he was at. Paul did not care how high the official were. The higher the official, the more. It, it's like saying him sick him to a bulldog. When Paul was in this court of law, finally he had the floor. Finally he had his testimony to share with others. Father, thank you for Paul's testimony. And God, I pray as we look at this and we look at our own lives, God, you give every one of us a testimony. We all have a If we are born again, if we are saved, we have been changed. And God, I pray as we keep going through all these things and and folks, people are struggling. People are depressed. People are hurting. People are, you know, without hope. They, they just, they are, Lord. And God, I pray that you would just use us to tell them about Jesus, to share our testimony, and, and maybe even the Roman road. Lord, we need to have that marked in our Bibles. We need to be able to share that with folks. And God... That's what you left us here for. We are ambassadors. We're your representatives. So God, I pray as we go out this week that we will be looking for divine appointments. We will look for somebody that we can tell uh, you know, our testimony and tell them about Jesus. God, I just pray, Lord, if there's a Christian here that needs to rededicate their life or come for baptism, or even church membership, Lord, that you would just speak to them through the Holy Spirit. And God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, just one, God, I pray they would come today. God, we love you. We praise you. We glorify your name. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoke to you in any way, would you come?